In the name of Allah, the entirely merciful, the especially merciful. O you who have believed, when the Adhan is called for the prayer on the day of Jumu'ah, then proceed to the remembrance of Allah and leave trade. That is better for you, if you only knew. Alhamdulillah, الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنحتدي الأولى أن حدان الله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لغتة من لساني يفقه قولي وصلوات الله والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين We begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he is most worthy and deserving of being praised We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us, to prevent us from being misguided and from misguiding others. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us of our sins, those that we commit knowingly and unknowingly, consciously and unconsciously. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us in these final days of Ramadan, to accept of our fast, of our qiyam, of our salawat, of our ruku, our sujood, and our dua. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us as a community those things that we err and fall into error. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help and bless the Muslims everywhere. Ameen. Respected brothers and sisters, we find ourselves by the blessings and the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the final days of Ramadan and in fact today according to some tradition known as the farewell Friday or Jummatul Wada the final Friday of the month of Ramadan and so these are indeed precious and by precious I mean they are precious because they are numbered and few and I say precious because they are immeasurable in terms of their value. These are precious days that we have uh, before us. And these are precious moments that we, by the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, have been given life to enjoy, to benefit from. And so, first and foremost, as a reminder to myself and to all of us to take advantage to the best of our abilities these days that are and these days and these nights in particular that are indeed precious in the most profound sense of the word precious I want to touch or call your attention to something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in a verse that I'm sure all of us have heard time and time again especially in the month of Ramadan because this is the verse that calls or more particular obligates makes obligatory compulsory the fasting and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah Ya ayyuhu alladheena amanu kutiba alaykum as-siyam kama kutiba ala alladheena min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O you who believe, O people of faith, have, uh, uh, fasting has been prescribed to you, excuse me, fasting has been made obligation, has, made it, has been made an obligation upon you, as it was made an obligation to those that came before you. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ So that you may develop God consciousness a and, and develop taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I wish to call your attention to the first part of the verse, or perhaps the second part of the verse, which says that fasting has been prescribed to you, but in particular has been prescribed to those as it was prescribed and commanded to those that came before you. Right? Min qablikum. And what that shows us is that fasting is nothing new and in fact we know that fasting was something that earlier communities were also obligated to do in fact when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he arrived in Medina after the Hijrah 
one of the first things, one of the first encounters that he had with the Israelites, with the, with the Jewish tribes, was that he noticed that they were fasting on the day of Ashura, which is, according to our calendar, the 10th of Muharram. And so when he asked them, why are you fasting on this day? They responded to him and they said that this, we believe that this is the day uh, of our Ashura, of our uh, being saved from the clutches of the Pharaoh, of the Fir'aun. That Musa والسلام, and the Israelites were saved from the persecution and oppression of the Fir'aun. They were delivered, the day of deliverance. And so that is why we fast. And so the Prophet وسلم, he said to his followers that indeed we have more of a right to Musa والسلام, and so we too should fast on this day. And that he differentiated it by fasting, by also adding the fast of the day before, the 9th of Muharram or the 11th of Muharram. And so the Prophet said, what we learn here is again that fasting was a tradition that was enjoined by other communities. But also what we find here is in the Prophet وسلم, embarking on this fast knowing that this was something that the Jewish community was doing is also something that is noteworthy. And the theme today that I wish to explore is the idea of engagement and disengagement. The idea of engaging and the idea of disengaging. And by engaging, I mean, and in particular in the context of this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, and in the context of the verse of Surah Al-Baqarah, engagement here is seen in that the Muslims engaged in a tradition, engaged in a practice that was the religious tradition and the practice of earlier communities. That is to say, not in the form of mimicry, not in the form of imitation, but in the form of engagement, in the sense that understanding that the earlier communities, in particular the Bani Israel and the, and the, the, the Yahud and the Nasar, the Jews and the Christians, belonged to that Abrahamic faith. And so what the Prophet ﷺ was engaging in, was engaging in the Abrahamic tradition. And that Abrahamic tradition called earlier communities to fast. And that fasting was an engagement in that earlier tradition, in the earlier traditions of the communities and the religious traditions that preceded us, historically speaking. And so that is the lesson here of engagement. But to extrapolate from that, or I'm sorry, before I go there, to continue though, we also find in this very example the idea of disengagement. What do I mean in this particular context? When the Prophet ﷺ instructed his followers to fast on that day, and the early scholars, or the scholars tell us that in those early days, that fast was a fast that was, oblig that was obligatory. It was a wajib, it was a fard to fast on that day, on the day of Ashura. Because this was before the command to fast in the month of Ramadan had been uh, revealed to the Prophet ﷺ. So that community, the earlier Muslim community was, was prescribed and they were commanded to fast on this day. But notice what the Prophet ﷺ did. And this is why I made it a point to call your attention to the fact that he wasn't simply doing it out of mimicry or imitation, but engagement. But how the Prophet ﷺ in his remarkable genius also did was that he disengaged in a way as well. In that he commanded his followers to not only fast on the 10th of Muharram, to not only fast on the day of Ashura, but to differentiate, to differ, to differentiate it from the fast of the Jews by fasting on the 9th or the 11th. By adding a day before or a day after. So in a sense, a, a balance, if you will, between these two notions of engagement on the one hand, but disengagement on the other hand. To be different. And to be different is not necessarily a bad thing. To stand out, to be unique, to be distinguished, 
All right, even the word distinguished implies what? That it is something positive. So to be different from those communities, to be different in the way in which we approach even the fasting, right, is not necessarily a bad thing and indeed it is a praiseworthy thing. And so the idea of even differentiating when it comes to fasting, we find examples in the Quran of earlier prophets, earlier communities fasting, and their fasting was different than our fasting. For example, uh, the fast that is reported, or Maryam alayhi salatu was salam, the mother, the father, the, the mother, uh, excuse me, Mary, the mother of Jesus, fasted, uh, but her fast was in one way, or one particular uh, uh, manifestation of her fast, was to be silent, to remain silent, not to uh, engage in conversation during a certain period of the day, to be in isolation. That was her fast. And that was indeed a fast that was also followed by other members of her family. And you can find this in uh, Surah Al-Ali Imran, referenced. We also know that the, earlier, that the fast of the earlier Muslim community, that is to say, when the fasting was first prescribed and, uh, and made obligatory upon the companions, their fasting was also a little different than the fast that was later, uh, recta, well, that was later uh, changed. That is to say that they would fast and they would engage, they would not engage in uh, marital relations even in the nighttime. And that was later then, uh, uh, you know, lifted and then Muslims were allowed to not only eat and drink uh, in the evening hours, in the night hours, but, but also to engage in marital relationships. So indeed, that fast was also uh, different. It was tweaked, if you will. So the idea, again, of being that the fasting of earlier communities uh, was changed and it was made differentiated by the fast of the Prophet ﷺ, and in particular, the fast of Ramadan. So the idea of both engagement and what? Disengagement. But to extrapolate from that and to draw beyond just those examples of fasting or the examples of uh, the, the fast of the day of Ashura, the idea of engagement also has to do with how we view our place in this world, in this dunya. And I would submit to you that there is always a tension that remains as we live our lives, as we go to work, as we go to school, as we engage in our uh, family affairs, in our community affairs. There is always this tension between engagement and disengagement. Engaging with the dunya and disengaging with the dunya. And unlike earlier communities that went to either one extreme or another, the Muslim community and the way of Islam was to strike a balance. Ummatul Wasata, right? We are indeed Kadalika Jalnakum Ummatul Wasata. That indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us a, 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 a balanced community, a middlemost community. We don't we avoid the extremes, especially the extremes that were engaged in, uh, if you pardon that expression, engaged in by the earlier communities. But so the idea here again, going back to the idea of engagement and disengagement with the dunya. Unlike previous communities, uh, and, and this is something that even the Quran addresses and something that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam addressed, which was specifically the idea of monasticism. Rabbahniyat, the Rabbahniyat tradition. The idea of being living like ascetics or hermits isolating oneself. What does a hermit do? What's a hermit? Hermit is someone who isolates themselves from the world. They go live off in some, you know, cave or in the boonies and they just isolate themselves. Complete isolationists. Right? But that isn't, that's monasticism in the strictest sense. What do monks do? They isolate themselves from the dunya. They don't marry. They don't engage in trade and business and commerce. They don't go to school. All they do is they live in a monastery. Uh, excuse me. They, 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 they live in a monastery and they do uh, and and they worship God. That's what a monk does. That is the ascetic or monastic tradition. And this was something that the Prophet ﷺ completely forbade. 
He said, لا ربهنيات في الدين There is no monasticism in this religion. So the idea of disengaging entirely from the world, the idea of living like monks, is not the tradition of Islam. It is not the Muslim tradition. We are a world-affirming theology. We are a world-affirming religious tradition. In that we believe that we must engage in this dunya. We must engage in this dunya. Not live in complete isolation from it. Uh, and that the dunya and, the, and, and, and worldly needs and worldly affairs, they have their rights upon us. They have their rights upon us. And we must uh, fulfill those duties and those rights. So a balance between engagement of this dunya, living a life that is full and righteous, but living a life that is, but, but, but balancing that between the idea of disengagement, which I will get to a little later. But here again, if we, re if we reflect upon the month of Ramadan, and the fasting that we do, and the ibadat, the ibadat that we do in the month of Ramadan, we see this idea of engagement and disengagement. Because as you know, very, you know, all too well, we don't fast in perpetuity for the month of Ramadan. That is to say, we don't fast for the entire month, refraining from drink, from, from food and, and beverage, and from engaging in marital relationships for the entire month. We fast in the daytime hours, and we break our fast when it's time to break our fast. In fact, it is of our tradition, it is of our sunnah to, to, to break the fast, to be, to be earnest in breaking the fast. That is to say, to break the fast as soon as the time comes in, and not to, de and not to delay the iftar. That's not from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That in, indeed to hasten to the breaking of fast is something that the sunnah that is part of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So we fast for some portions of the day, and we eat for other portions of the day. Again, remembering that there is a need that our bodies have a right in a, a fulfillment that must or sorry needs and obligations that must be fulfilled that our bodies place upon us and that we cannot fast in perpetuity. Our bodies would not allow it. And indeed when the Prophet ﷺ overheard companions who said that they would engage in fasting perpetually, that is to say they would fast every single day and that they would stay up all night in doing ibadah, in, in doing prayers and worship and that they would not marry. The Prophet ﷺ, he reprimanded them and he said, that I sometimes fast and sometimes I do not fast. And the best fast for you is the fast of the Prophet Da'ud which is to fast on, uh, on uh, you know, fast every other day. And then he said that I, 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 I pray certain nights and I sleep certain nights. Or I pray a portion of the night and I sleep a portion of the night. And I marry. And marriage is among, is among my sunnah, is from my sunnah. And so reminding those followers, those companions, those disciples, that again, you cannot completely disengage from this world. We do not reject the dunya, but rather we must live a life that is full and righteous. But we live that life in this dunya. And our station in the akhirah, how we place in the life hereafter is predicated upon how we live this life. This life has consequences. This life has a purpose. And that purpose will be, uh, uh, the purpose behind that will be shown to us and will, and will be revealed to us in the Akhirah, in the life hereafter. So in the month of Ramadan and in our fast, we see this idea of engagement and disengagement. Uh, and to then, in my concluding remarks, to draw your attention in particular to these last 10 days. Because these last 10 days of Ramadan are unique and are distinguished. In that this was a time when the Prophet ﷺ would engage in the i'tikaf. And that is to say that he would completely isolate himself to completely disengage, if momentarily, from all worldly affairs. To disengage from anything except 
doing the ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And unfortunately, here we are in the last 10 days of Ramadan, and either because of obligations of work or school or other obligations, we're here. We're out and about. We aren't able to engage in that kind of i'tikaf. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept the little that we can do in fulfilling His command and the command and, and the sunnah and following the sunnah of our beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the Prophet in these days, the sunnah in this day, in these days, is to completely disengage from the world. To completely disengage from the world. But remember again, mind you, that disengagement is temporary. But the fact that the Prophet ﷺ would do that is a reminder for us and something for us to reflect upon. And that is that brothers and sisters, while we live a life that is full, a life of righteousness, a life of engagement in this dunya, sometimes, sometimes we just need disengagement. Sometimes we just need isolation. And indeed, i'tikaf, isolation, uh, whether it's in the masjid or in the confines of your own house somewhere, is something that we can engage in year-round. There are nafila i'tikaf that you can do any time, in any place, uh, and, uh, any time in particular. So, but in particular in these days of the month of Ramadan is what the Prophet ﷺ would do. But the world and engagement in the world, the toil and the struggle of going to work, of uh, fretting over the bills, of making ends meet, uh, of dealing with familial issues, uh, dealing with uh, all of the challenges the, uh, and the frustrations of this life. And each and every one of us carry burdens that are unique to our own, that are unique to ourselves. I don't carry your burdens. You don't carry my burdens. We each and every one of us as individuals carry our own tribulations, carry our own uh, struggles and trials. But we need, but that, that takes a toll on us. That has a toll on our lives. It has a toll on our well-being. It has a toll on our psychology. It has a toll, it weighs down upon our self, upon our, our excuse me, upon our soul. It weighs down. It brings us down. The very notion of this dunya is wrought, if you will, with gravity. And what is gravity? It, a gravity is a force that pulls us down by its very nature. This dunya, right, is, a, is, 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 is something that has a debilitating effect. It pulls us down with it. But, and so what we need to uh, recalibrate to recharge our batteries is disengagement. To shut off the noise, right? To turn off the cell phones, to get off Facebook, to get off Twitter, and to get off the internet, right? And to just disengage, right? I mean, it's like, you know, in, you know, in, in modern society, it's like, well, I can't get a Wi-Fi signal, right? I mean, we need to be constantly connected. We need to be constantly downloading. And when we're not, we complain, like, what's wrong with the wireless network? I can't, I can't get my email, or what's wrong with the network in the house? I can't get to the internet. What's wrong with the network at, wor at work? I can't do whatever I have to do. We want to be constantly plugged in. But our souls, our psychology, sometimes we need to unplug. Sometimes we need to disengage from this life. We need to disengage in this world, from this world. And these days, these final days of Ramadan, these final days in which the Prophet ﷺ would engage in his i'tikaf, those are the days of disengagement. These are the days to disengage. And so whatever time we have, here we are on Friday evening, for those of us who have jobs that are Monday through Friday, take the time away from your families. Uh, go and do i'tikaf in one of your local masajid until Sunday night or Monday morning or whatever the time allows. And indeed, we find ourselves in the midst of not only the final 10 days, but those precious odd nights, uh, which according to some opinion, not all opinions, uh, are, is the night in which Laylatul Qadr will fall. But remember that the night of Laylatul Qadr, the night of Qadr can come to us any night of Ramadan, or any, last, any night of the final 10 days. Those, there are multiplicity of opinions. 
Uh, it's not the uh, Jumhuri opinion. It is not the most uh, authentic opinion. It is not even perhaps the most strongest opinion that the 27th night is the night of Laylatul Qadr. And the practice of, of the Muslim community through the ages has been to seek out the night of, uh, to seek out Laylatul Qadr. And not just simply resign ourselves psychologically to the idea that, well, I know it's the 27th. You know, I mean, we have to have calendars and timetables and we need to know what day it is so I can take off. So, well, you know what, by that same logic, I have to know what, day, what night Laylatul Qadr is. And so, 27th it is. That's not how the Muslims live their lives throughout the centuries. They sought out Laylatul Qadr because it was indeed such a precious night, such a beloved night. And so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again accept from us the little or the lot that we do in, this, in these final days of this blessed month of Ramadan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us, forgive us of our sins, to, uh, uh, to exonerate us from our sins, to uh, grant us rahmah and maghfirah in these days, and to, and to deliver us from the punishment of the fire and the adab and nar. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika shadu wa la ilaha 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 wa astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس تقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما وبعد يا إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم ربنا ربنا لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إسرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا بوعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك اللهم إنك عفو كريم تحب العفو عفو عنا اللهم إنك عفو كريم تحب العفو عفو عنا اللهم إنك عفو كريم تحب العفو وعفو عنا سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين وعقيم الصلاة In the name of Allah, the entirely merciful, the especially merciful. O you who have believed, when the Adhan is called for the prayer on the day of Jumu'ah, then proceed to the remembrance of Allah and leave trade. That is better for you, if you only knew. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لغتة من لساني يفقه قولي وصلوات الله والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين We begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he is most worthy and deserving of being praised We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to prevent us from being misguided and from misguiding others Made an obligation to those that came before you لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ so that you may develop God consciousness a and, and develop taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but I wish to call your attention to the first part of the verse or perhaps the second part of the verse which says that fasting has been prescribed to you but 
in particular, has been prescribed to those as it was prescribed and commanded to those that came before you, right? Min qablikum. And what that shows us is that fasting is nothing new. And in fact, we know that fasting was something that earlier communities were also obligated to do. In fact, when the Prophet وسلم, when he arrived in Medina after the Hijrah, one of the first things, one of the first encounters that he known as the Farewell Friday or Jummatul Wada, the final Friday of the month of Ramadan. And so these are indeed precious. And by precious, I mean they are precious because they are numbered and few. And I say precious because they are immeasurable in terms of their value. These are precious days that we have uh, before us. And these are precious moments that we, by the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, have been given life to enjoy, to benefit from. And so, first and foremost, as a reminder to myself and to all of us, to take advantage to the best of our abilities these days that are, and these days and these nights in particular, that are indeed precious in the most profound sense of the word precious. I want to touch or call your attention to something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in a verse that I'm sure all of us have heard time and time again, especially in the month of Ramadan. Because this is the verse that calls or more particular obligates, makes obligatory, compulsory the fasting. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ الصِّيَامِ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh, you who believe, O oh, people of faith, have uh, uh, fasting has been prescribed to you, excuse me, fasting has been made obligation, has, made it, has been made an obligation upon you. As it was, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us of our sins. Those that we commit knowingly and unknowingly, consciously and unconsciously. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us in these final days of Ramadan, to accept of our fast, of our qiyam, of our salawat, of our ruku, our sujood and our dua. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us as a community those things that we err and fall into error. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help and bless the Muslims everywhere. Ameen. Respected brothers and sisters, we find ourselves by the blessings and the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the final days of Ramadan. And in fact, today, according to some tradition,